Hello and welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dr. Vicki Shields, and I'm proud to serve as your provost and executive vice president. Throughout the year, I encourage you to read the updates from the Office of the Provost that come out every two weeks in your email. The updates keep you apprised of what is happening in academic affairs, student affairs, and student services. As soon as it is safe, uh, we will hold our Reclaiming Our Culture Day. We're looking forward to that. I would like to wish a warm welcome to all of our newest faculty and staff members today. And now I'm thrilled to move to this momentous occasion in the history of Nevada State College. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce our new president, Dr. Darian Pollard. President Pollard was appointed by the Nevada State System of Higher Education Board of Regents in April 2021 to lead our dynamic and robust institution. Today is her first day. Dr. Pollard is the eighth president of Nevada State College and the first black female president of any NSHE institution. This is Dr. Pollard's third presidency. She comes to us from Montgomery College in Maryland where she is highly beloved and served as president for over a decade. As a parting gift, Montgomery College named a building after her. Yes, I know. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Pollard at the helm to lead us through this next innovative chapter of our incredibly revered institution. There will be time at the end for questions from the audience. So, President Pollard, welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Shields. I, I want to extend just a profound uh, level of gratitude to you, uh, in particular over the last month as you've worked with the transition as President Patterson uh, accepted a wonderful retirement. <laughs> I understand he's enjoying that, uh, but as well, uh, just thank you for stepping in and taking on a set of additional responsibilities and all the people then the cascade as a result of that. So thank you, uh, Vicki, for that. I look forward to a wonderful and long working and personal relationship with you. Uh, in addition to that, I want to thank uh, Dr. Gwen Sharp uh, for her work in organizing and behind the scenes, Brian uh, as well for his work in this, and of course, uh, those folks in my office, Amber, uh, Dr. Amber uh, Lassiter, uh, who is making sure that I am not late uh, to anything at this particular point in adventures, making sure as well that I feel as welcomed as possible. Let me share with each of you, I am delighted uh, to be here, so tremendously excited uh, because this is, I believe, where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be. And I am uh, delighted to have this experience with you all. I've had the warmest welcome possible uh, from each and every member of the college community and also our external uh, partners and friends as well. Uh, has been so warm, so kind, uh, so gentle and so informative. And I just want to thank you for that. So my first day, I walk in full of energy, uh, deeply grateful for this moment. I'm gonna talk about great gratitude in a moment uh, because your support has been tremendous. Um, I'm gonna get started and we're gonna go forward uh, in this deck. And I, well, I want to hopefully allow you to have some moments of reprieve from just looking at me by also looking at a series of things that I think will help supplement some of the comments I'm gonna offer here today. Uh, Bell Hooks, uh, someone who I tremendously uh, look up to uh, because of her intellect, but also her way of saying things, has a quote that she says that people resist by telling their stories. So I'm gonna tell you, if you don't mind, in this introductory speech to you, my story, a little bit about who I am, and I've divided these comments today into three movements, uh, an introduction about who I am and how I show up in this work. And then second part about who I am and how it then influences the way I view leadership. And then the third part would be a reflection about 
uh, the next several months about this transition, clearly recognizing that while today is my first day, a first day doesn't mean as soon as it's over, I'm now uh, acclimated and I know everything I need to know. Uh, I've intentionally worked with a group of people to design a transition into the organization. I need your help and support. And over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about that. But let me tell you about Darian. And I, I hope all of you will take the opportunity. And I would normally, if we were in a group, have you practice saying my name because I know it looks a little bit different than it sounds. Uh, but it was a name that my father gave me. Uh, I'm the first child, and as a result of that, I got all the benefits of the names. Uh, he made this up, Darian, and my middle name is Paulette after him. Uh, but what's very important about that is that we all know that who we are influences the way that we show up in different spaces. And for me, uh, one of the words I think deliberately is an underestimated term in leadership is consistency. So many of you may have heard me talk about this when I was here for my interview. I believe in being the same person privately, publicly, and personally. I had a dear friend uh, talk about that as one of my best attributes. And I believe that's important because consistency, uh, I will never have to worry about saying something in one spot versus saying it someplace else because you will hear the same sentiment. Uh, yes, I'm smart enough, I hope emotionally intelligent enough uh, to fine tune that where necessary, but Darian works hard to be consistent and it's a value of how I also choose to lead. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about another value of mine if we look at this next slide, and it's about gratitude. Um, I have said in many spaces that gratitude is my religion. Uh, it's the way in which I approach the world. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to read a book called Simple Abundance, and it was a day book that started off by having us uh, keep a gratitude journal. And at first it was so hard. I would write things down. Oh, I'm glad I woke up this morning or, and he had to write down three things. And by the end of the first month, I want to share with you all my gratitude journal and my list every day. I had to make myself stop because I was filling up the page because gratitude uh, when done well, uh, makes you intentionally mindful about who you are and what you are. So I want to share with you this, this slide. This is actually a few of uh, the next several slides are pictures, but this one here, um, this is actually from my home uh, in Maryland. It was on a wall that we had, a live with love, grace, and gratitude. It was a bulletin board. And every day uh, we tried to write down things that we were grateful for. Uh, I did that, uh, Robin did, my wife, and then our son, Miles. And some days it was, uh, you'll see that we had a game night or I had a good cardio session. I made a doctor's appointment. Mile oftentimes talked about family game night and food uh, always seems to uh, get in his. Robin, who is uh, very organized, often talked about some accomplishment in his. But every week uh, we would sit down at the end of the week after we've done this and kind of talk about this over the uh, dinner, which is very important to us. Uh, my journey, uh, like many of you, has been one that's been filled with joy and pain, a challenge and opportunity. Um, but what we've tried to do as a family is to be uh, so intentional that we have built a life that we loved uh, because we love each other and we love uh, this, this work uh, that we get to do and that I get to do as a college president. It has changed the way uh, that I think about the world uh, because I believe in the potency of higher education. I know for a fact that I would not be right here in this space right now if it were not for the fact uh, that higher education came into my life and changed the trajectory of it. So uh, between gratitude and consistency, I believe those are two of the values uh, that lead me to who I am and it, it encourages me to think about how I choose to lead. Now, this next slide, though, um, as you've heard me mention it, um, my first and deepest love is my family. Um, and I'm un unapologetic about that priority uh, that I place on these humans that I get to call family. So for us, date night is important. Um, it is important for us to be together as a family. We try to have dinner together at least four to five times a week. A matter of fact, on Friday, we've already planned our family date night. Uh, we go out to our new favorite sushi restaurant we'll be doing on Friday. Uh, it's about game nights. It's about that sacred time of travel. It's also about the belief that my first job um, if I do it well, is to make sure that I show up for these people. So there will be times when you will hear me say, I can't do that 
because I need to go home or Miles has a basketball game or I'm helping Miles edit an English paper or we've got to figure out some experiment or Robin has a board she's on and I want to let her make sure that she's out doing that so I need to be someplace else. That's important and I want you because I've heard us as a college and the things I've read and the conversations I've had talk about family as a value. So this is my family and we try to do this work that we do and the way we live just try to be good people uh, and we try to show up in the ways that we think we can um, and we know that um, the most important thing that I do though is this boy uh, that we get to raise and he is a product of Robin and I's conspiracy on love uh, this belief that if we practice love grace patience and audacious hope uh, this child uh, will be uh, the man that we know this world needs us to be so as we look at the next slide, you'll see that for me, the most important role that I have is that of parent. Uh, we do lots of basketball uh, in our family. He's a very talented uh, basketball player, but I'll also say he's a scholar athlete. So we work in this picture here, we're actually doing at that point, um, I think we're building a sale, but we had to do it using organic food products. That was quite fun. And then we also do a lot of superheroes in our family. So I think that was he and I going out to see uh, the, uh, the one of the last superhero movies, I believe. Well, I don't remember which one it was. That being said, we believe in snuggles and love. And I'm hopeful that you'll get to see him because I know for me, uh, Robin and I raising a black boy right now, uh, it is not just what we do, it's about a community. And we recognize the value of that community that we have. Um, I also have a sister, and let me tell you about her next. You'll see her in this slide. Uh, normally I would have had, at uh, the next slide please, you would have seen me uh, talk about uh, my father and him. Many of you know I lost my father uh, while I was here for my interview. So this little nuclear family is just my sister. Uh, I often call her the knower of my known. Uh, she's someone who I adore and I hope that you all will have the opportunity to meet her. Uh, she's quite the songstress as well. So whenever I have an opportunity to share her gift of music uh, with people, I try to do so. She's my only sister and she's someone who um, is tremendously important to me. Um, but because family is important to me, what you'll also know for me is that I believe that uh, I am a part of a tribe. I exist because I have a tribe of people who love and care about me, who protect me, and who allow me to protect them. Um, it's this idea that, as we say in the neighborhood where I grew up on the south side of, south side of Chicago, we ride hard for each other. Um, and I love this because I think it captures this African concept, this idea that I am because we are. Um, and this idea that each of us, our humanity is only best seen and understood by our relationship, our mutuality uh, with others as well. So you'll see in this next slide here, uh, pictures of folks who are important to me, uh, my secret keepers, my truth tellers, uh, my best friends, my ports in a storm, uh, the people who help keep me grounded and honest. And I do the work each and every day uh, to make sure that I am intentional about that. And this, this next slide are more of these. And, and I'm intentional about this because our friend group is gloriously diverse. They're long-term, they're loyal, they're talented, they're affirming, and they recognize that there is a gift in each and every one of us. And we work on that. Uh, we talk about kindness and clarity. Uh, we talk about this belief of trying to make the world a better place. Uh, we believe in laughter and love. I'm a Midwesterner by training and by choice and also by origin. And as a result of that, I believe in playing hard, but I also believe in working hard. And I believe that is important that you understand who I am and how I choose to show up. I certainly recognize that many of you will call me President Pollard. Some of you will call me Dr. Pollard. But at the end of the day, here's the thing, y'all, I'm Darian. I know this and I hope that you will feel comfortable in that. I do not want on my tombstone when I die for it to say she was a phenomenal college president at the top. I actually will come back and haunt some people if it says that. What I wanted to say is that she was a dedicated and loving parent. She was a glorious spouse. She was a hell of a girlfriend. Uh, she liked good tequila. She laughed loud. Uh, she knew how to take a good joke. She was caring and she was committed to the work of open and committed access to the extent we can have to higher education. That to me is what I'm about. So at the end of the day, 
um, as I've shared before, if you go to the next slide, uh, Bell Hooks has said this, people resist by telling their story. I've tried to tell you the story of who I am because then that profoundly influences the way I choose to lead. For me, leadership oftentimes is an act of resistance, uh, but it is also a way of thinking about how we choose the work. I was talking with one of our regents this morning, our chair, and she said that it is a ministry of presence. And I love this idea because resistance and presence and mindfulness and gratitude all come together and consistency is what I try to do in the work that I do. So as a result of that, I need you to know that my resistance and my story is as complex and as simple as everyone else's. And the next slide illustrates that. Um, I grew up in a space where my father constantly told me, I expect no less. I come home and say, daddy, I did this. or we had this great day or I made this accomplishment even until uh, my interview here. And I told him I had been invited for an interview and I was coming in, I kept him abreast of the process. And every single time he told me, I expect no less. Um, and I believe that mamba mentality, that quest to be the best version of yourself. I'm constantly at work at that, but I know I'm a flawed human. Um, so while many girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice, I'm made of a little bit different of that. I like adventure, uh, dark chocolate, intelligence, a few cuss words every now and again, and courage. So this complexity of who I am, I think, shows up in different ways. And my resistance then does not, does not lack clarity. If you look at the next slide, I'm very clear about the fact, and I love this, if I could turn this into a personal mission statement, I would. I have to see all the parts of me. People oftentimes ask, you know, why are you out in the, in the workspace or how do you choose to show up? And I think that if I'm to do my work well, I have to show up and let you know who I am. I have to show up in a way that's intentional so that we are understanding that we are compelled to do this work and compelled to lead from who we are, while at the same time recognizing that every experience is not our own. And we wanna make sure that we are amplifying that. So this work that we do at Nevada State College, this, this work that called to me off of a webpage and said to me, Darian, this is where you need to be. Darian, this is the work, this college is about this work. That for me is here right now. It calls me to an organization that sees the work as different and profound. Um, I would tell you each and every day when I tell people that I now have the joy of working at and with Nevada State College and these students and the work that you've been doing, I get to start bragging about it. It fills me with profound joy and pride. So for me, this idea that we have about education as an agent of social justice, as my next slide talks about, uh, it spoke to me because Nevada State College had jumped off the page um, because it is a privilege. We recognize the privilege of education and the privilege that if we do this well, that the liberatory nature of a liberal arts education has profound impacts, not on just individuals, but on their families and the communities that we serve. And then if we think about this more deeply, and as the next slide talks about, Cornel West said this, and many of you saw this when I did my interview here, that social justice is what love looks like in public. If I love you, I do not want you to be hungry. I do not want you to be unhoused. I do not want you to not be educated. Right. So for us, we are in an act of social justice. So I can disagree with you about lots of different things, but what I can't disagree and will not engage in a conversation on is about my oppression or the oppression of others and the denial of the humanity of education and the right to exist and thrive in this space. That's what I think our work is. And I see that each and every day when I have the conversations and I learn more deeply about how Nevada State College came to be and the work that we choose to do. And I refuse to be silenced about that. The next slide talks about this and Audre Lorde is one of my favorites when she says, your silence will not protect you, you all, prior to my arrival, and I'm so honored to join this course, have not been silent about what higher education is and should be. You have not been silent about transforming 
in order to meet the students we have now. Not the ones we wish we had, not the ones we used to have, but the students we have now and the mission that we have now. So I implore you, I want to lift up and amplify this message, this mission of what we say we want to do. So for me, all of this leads me to an ethos statement about how I choose to do this work. I believe, and as your leader, as a president of this institution, as one of the leaders of this institution, let me even correct myself in saying that, I have a leadership ethos statement that's very simple. I don't want to just say something, excuse me, I just don't want to talk. I want to say something that's meaningful. I just don't want to be good. I want to be relevant. I don't want to just inspire. I want to empower. I don't just want to know my own weaknesses. I want to know my limitations because then if I do that, I can expect you to be uncomfortable as we continue to grow and transform. But I also, as this person in this space, this human can also be willing to be uncomfortable myself. And that to me is what my leadership ethos is about. It's how I try to do this. That second one is importance about relevance. Um, you know, I can remember many years ago, I was at a conference in Seattle and I went in and not unlike this beautiful phone I have on my desk right now, this phone was sitting on the desk in the, in the, in the hotel room and it was beautiful. I mean, it, it greeted me, hello, Dr. Pollard. And it had, um, you know, pictures of, of Seattle all that I could, you know, I would come in and just sometimes look in the middle of the night, the lights would just go off. It was a beautiful phone. But for the week that I was there, I never picked up that phone because what did we do at those times? We used our cell phones and we would call each other if we were moving out or going to a different space. I don't even think that I even used it to order any breakfast or coffee or tea uh, because guess what? There was a uh, deli in the lobby, but more importantly, you could use the TV to make that order. So while you had this beautiful phone that was in the space, it was good, it was not relevant. What I know for sure is that Nevada State College is relevant. Uh, we exist for a purpose. And right now, our nation, our state, and our community needs us now more than ever. So when I think about this leadership ethos, how do I translate that then into what I call an, an, a leadership imperative, particularly around diversity, equity, and inclusion, which I know is at the DNA of this organization. And I believe that we embrace our role as an anchor institution and not just an anchor for Henderson, not just an anchor for Southern Nevada, but we are an anchor for the state of Nevada and we will be an anchor for this nation. And by the time we get done, I suspect an anchor as well for this globe because we are going to work intentionally, and you already have been doing this, to remove barriers, to create pathways, to ensure relevancy for our students and community and to protect our mission because we know that no student is expendable and every part of our community belongs to us. Let me say to you all that I believe that we are fighting and educating and we're using our privilege because let's not forget, this is a privilege to do this work. There's power that comes from being a member of the academy but we're using our privilege to fight for those who may not have it because we're creating space at the table for them to join us and dare I say, displace some of the power structures that may have inhibited them to be there. So for us, y'all can say I'm getting more excited as we go through this. And if, you're, if I could feel your energy in the room, I want you to know this is the work I believe of higher education of boundary spanning institutions like Nevada State College. And I think about this because there's a roadmap about how we approach this work. And a roadmap is I introduced and talked with you about this when I was here back in April. That, and this is, a, I think, a roadmap. We, it says for racial equity, but it could be for gender equity, for uh, equity about those who learn differently. When we think about those who may come uh, to us after serving our country, all of the equity that we have to imbue into our system to create success for our students. To me, and I saw this um, not too long ago in, in the Harvard Business Review, a very simple model about acknowledging and naming our problems, 
owning our ability to do something about it, not deflecting. As I watch some of the conversations even are taking place right now about what's happening in our world with Afghanistan right now. And I see this deflecting, well, whose fault was it? Or who did this or who didn't do that? And all I keep saying, okay, but we got people whose lives are at risk. As I look at what's happening in Haiti right now, how do we acknowledge and name the problems? We own the abilities that we have to do something about it. And then we intentionally design, redesign, deconstruct and reconstruct solutions to problems. And that's what you've been doing. I've watched over the summer, the work you're doing around assessment. When I look at the work that you're doing around uh, uh, students who are experiencing food insecurity, homeless, uh, homelessness and experiencing those things in their family, this is the work work that is a part of that, in addition to teaching people and encouraging them how to learn, how to read, how to write, how to discern, how to think differently about the scientific process, to go out and to serve in healthcare and business and how to teach the next generation. This is a part of the work. So when you think about, again, for me, how that first part influences how I lead, this is it right here. I will always be thinking about how to acknowledge and own our problems. What's the current condition? And then do we have enough empathy as an institution and dare I say the courage to go out and tackle what's there and then at the same time be willing to correct. This press model is something you'll be hearing me talk more about over the next several months and years because I believe this is what will distinguish us as an institution of higher education in the state of Nevada. That takes me to this notion of radical inclusion. And some of you all heard me talk about this. It's a conceptual framework that um, comes in this idea from me about where we think about intentional and proactive policies, procedures, practices, and promises. And here, I know we have uh, looked at some of the work of our faculty, in particular in organizational psychology and the work that you all have done in the business space. This, I think, captures both the formal and informal the things we talk about and the things we don't talk about, policy, procedures, practices, and promises. We want to ensure equitable and inclusive experiences and outcomes for all students and employees. So th this came to me one day, I started watching about the first day on a college campus. We have such excitement and joy for all those folks who are coming to us. But what happens at the end of a degree program, we watch our commencement programs or we watch our penny ceremonies and we start to wonder what happened to all of those students who started, particularly our black and brown students, our first generation students, our students who come to us from uh, having had experiences of poverty. Why are they not there at the end? These to me uh, reflect on our need to talk about the value add. So for me, radical inclusion, to look at the, the Latin for radical, don't get distracted by those who say, ooh, radical, and they start thinking about this radical leftist agenda. I'm not even talking about that. What I'm talking about is radical, the Latin says to get to the root of things. So if we wanna to get to the root of inclusion, to get to the root of success for our students, to get to the root of higher education and to understand what our purposes are for existence, and it means that we must look at this from an academic, a legal, political, financial, and cultural experience and be very intentional about applying that press model to us. You're gonna hear me talk more and more and more about that over the next several months. But before you hear me talking, you're gonna hear and observe me watching and listening, which I think this next slide captures. Inexperienced leaders are quick to lead before knowing anything about the people they intend to lead, but mature leaders listen, learn, and then lead. If I, I know the alliteration work with listen, learn, and lead, but I would also say watch. I love to practice um, this idea of participant observation. I go in and I watch, and uh, my belief is if I do my job really, really well, I can get quiet and just see what happens, I observe. Uh, that's very important to me. And you all as a college community will be teaching me. So this idea, and I said today is my first day, uh, I, I'm really thinking about this idea, this journey of becoming a scorpion is a, the first 100 and one, 150 days, very deliberate and have, have sculpted this, I think in a way to help me understand and learn this organization because I want to know it intimately. 
I want to understand its ethos, its DNA. I want to understand how and why. I want to know the people of it. So you'll see I've identified a set of transition priorities uh, that I'm going to be focused on over the next few months. Again, understanding our points of pride and pain and opportunity uh, from our internal stakeholders as well as our external stakeholders. I need to learn the nomenclature and culture of our organization. And I also would offer to that of, of our system. Uh, many of you laugh, I, I have the hardest time with the Nietzsche. I keep wanting to say Nietzsche because of the, the S, Nietzsche. Just even that simple thing of being able to mark myself. I know we have different uh, terms that we use. You know, the easiest way of marking yourself as an outsider is never adapting the language. Uh, to the language of, of the organization you're going into. So I want to know that. I want to build a, fa a firm and strong foundation uh, by building strong relationships. And relationships take time. Uh, I want to be uh, an effective voice for Nevada State College with our chancellor and with our board of regents. So in order to do that, I have to build an effective relationship with them. I need to understand how our external stakeholders perceive our organization and how we partner with them. And even importantly, within the communities we have yet to serve, where do we need to go into the highways and byways to make sure that we're responding to those students? I wanna develop again, a deep understanding of our system, but its relationship with our organization. And I want to connect with our elected officials. I want to build relationships with our foundation because I believe that there are folks out there who want to contribute and need to contribute to this audacious mission that we have at Nevada State College. And I want to establish relationship with our alumni because they amplify. They are the best product and reflection of what we do within our organization. So these are the, the priorities that I've identified in this transition. And I'm going to do that. And we've already started with some day one tactics. You know, those of you may recognize that kind of phrase, you know, your day one friends. We started this early on. I established a transition advisory committee. I invited leadership and key voices to serve on a six month committee where they're going to advise me. They're going to translate for me and help me make meaning of what I'm hearing and learning. Uh, I've asked the phenomenal Chris uh, shots out of my office to serve as the uh, staffing for that. I've asked Dr. Amber Lopez Lassiter to serve as my broader transition coordinator. And I've also established a transition operations team that's supporting this. So uh, they're going to be the ones making sure I get to the places I need to go. But this transition advisory committee, as you can see, I want to thank all of you who agreed and accepted that and going to meet with me monthly and have accepted the meetings that are already there. I'm thinking deliberately, it's not going to be me when you just come in and hear me talk. Uh, I'm going to be asking questions of you. I'm going to be practicing the Socratic method, asking questions and listening and learning. And perhaps if we do it really well, you all will also learn something about the organization from a different perspective. But I'm also asking these people uh, to be effective surrogates because communication is dialogic. So therefore, I want them to go out and to talk about what they're hearing and seeing and what they're hearing from me, because it's important that we create this culture, uh, this ecosystem, where we're sharing information back and forth with each other. Um, this then takes me to the broader framework for the transition. Uh, many of you will, will find out there's probably not a conceptual framework that I run away from. I like them because it helps me think. So I've identified what I'm calling this three-part uh, framework for the transition. Communication is going to be dialogic and rich. It's going to have multiple prongs that will be overlapping layers in such a way that will start to create meaning. I want breadth and depth in that communication. A culture, again, listening and learning. Many of you have already been invited and several of you more will be invited to a series of what I'm calling listening and learning sessions. Please accept those. I'm gonna value your time, but also you're contributing to that schema making that I have to be doing. And then building relevant and impactful connections inside the organization and outside of the organization. When I talk about communication, uh, you'll see here that I'm talking about, again, uh, dialogic and rich. So we've already started to redefine the Office of the President website. Um, I'm hopeful that you'll see uh, information there that you'll find useful. Please go and visit and give us feedback. I'm going to be keeping uh, my calendar, um, a public calendar there, so people can see what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. I'm going to also be talking uh, to include uh, various opportunities and reflections on there. I'm actually uh, creating the making of a Scorpion transition 
uh, web subpage where I'm gonna be capturing uh, my knowledge and learning. Uh, I'm gonna establish some routine comms uh, with you all. I will be producing a weekly communication to the college community. I'm going to be engaging in social media. Many of you already found out I'm actually fairly prolific in some spaces. I, as I transitioned away from Montgomery College into Nevada State College, I kind of stepped back and now I'm coming back in, new handle and so forth. Facebook as well, Instagram. Uh, we've created the presidential website and you'll see different things that'll be there. Uh, we're gonna engage externally and turn up the volume about the work that's being done here at Nevada State College and talk about this unique moment that we exist in. And then in the spring, I'm gonna, uh, something I've done in a couple other places, this idea of walk the day in your shoes. If I really wanna understand the work of the organization, um, I have the opportunity to go and work uh, and with you for a few hours to understand your work. I've done this where I've worked third shift uh, with our public safety officers. I sat with our admissions people. I've done different things to help me understand the organization. So I come from an informed place, not simply a president by name only. I don't operate in that. Darian believes in understanding the work. And if I can understand how you do your work, it helps me understand what my role is in helping to support you. Because I have one belief about what leadership is. And it's while it's consistency and it's about being relevant, it's also about articulating a vision, providing the resources, giving direction and getting out of the way. So in order for me to do that last thing of getting out of your way, I've got to do the first three and that means understanding. So that means I'm going to be talking about culture and understanding and documenting it. In the next couple of weeks, you'll be receiving a survey from me where I'm going to ask people to provide feedback on a specific set of questions. And I've already also started to review some of the culture surveys that have been done, very powerful work. I wanna understand what you think needs to happen within the organization. What are some of the most pressing spaces? I'm trying to triangulate uh, my data collection. So I'm gonna have these listen and learns. I'm gonna have this survey. I'm gonna have a plethora of things to read, but I'm also gonna have opportunities for one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And at the end of that, it's gonna give me a way of really understanding who we are as an institution. As I mentioned, the Listen and Learn series on the next slide, um, we're gonna have these individually where people can share their perspectives, opportunities. I'm doing it with students, faculty, staff, our foundation board, the system level, alums, our business leaders, elected officials, social, social service partners, our accreditors and professional organizations of which we're members, our K-12 partners, our transfer institutions, all of these folks, and if you think of their folks that I have forgotten or I need to be thinking about, please make sure you send that in the chat. Uh, when we get done here, take some questions or send me an email. I welcome that uh, because that's the only way that I start to make sense of what I'm hearing. In addition to that, uh, I believe leadership is not something that's incidental. I think you have to show up for that. So I believe in, uh, we've uh, created a presidential boot camp uh, was a really immersive scaffolded experience to help me understand the architecture and infrastructure of our college and also of the system. So I have these deep learning dives I'm taking and many of you already uh, have been asked to provide the teacher. I become the student where I'm learning about multiple parts of the organization and beginning to really engage and again, intimately understanding and knowing our organization beyond what I have right now. I also believe that leadership is about accountability. Uh, so I will be establishing with my senior team, you can go to the next slide, uh, a set of leadership expectations and connections with them. I want to understand their stories. I wanna know how they show up and what, is, what informal and formal networks they have that we can begin to amplify. I wanna understand their goals and strategies for the year, identify their uh, the management or leadership style they need from me in order that they can show up the best that they can have. Uh, we're going to be talking about the value proposition and the rules of engagement. This is important to me. I've taught courses on leadership. And as a result of that, I believe that building a highly effective team is dependent upon communication and business processes. Um, none of us, none of us are here uh, because we simply volunteer to do this work. Uh, this is a business. Uh, it's also a business with a mission. So I wanna make sure that leadership and management is doing the work that it needs to do in order to really advance the mission and to really get out of the way of the people who are doing such powerful work here. 
And then we do that by building connections. So you're going to hear again, you're seeing some scaffolding and layering here. I've done a number of already meet and greets in August uh, and also a number of stakeholder receptions. I'm doing the Listen and Learn series. I'm going to be doing monthly one-on-one -on -one meetings with leadership and also those who serve in a governance role. Uh, college events, I've already had several that have come in and we're fitting them in where we can. And we're going to also hold a series of workforce and economic development summits. Uh, and these are some of the broad areas we're thinking about to really hear from our business and industry. Here's the thing about us in Nevada State. Uh, we have an opportunity to help people understand that economic development is workforce development. Workforce development is essential and as what we do as a part of the work of Nevada State College. So we are also about furniture of the mind, but we're also about making sure people have jobs. And we wanna help change generational poverty into folks having aspirations and dreams. I, I tell you all, uh, some of you may have heard me mention this before. I never forget Miles uh, was four and he was in the backseat of the car. And I said to him, baby, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he says, mama, and you know how you talk to him. And he said, mama, I want to be an engineer, because he couldn't quite say engineer, an artist and a ninja. And I've never forgotten that because here's a child who is, and he started that phrase off, which I didn't say, after I go to college. So what we have done in our family is disrupted a cycle of generational poverty by higher education. So my child says he wants to be an engineer, an artist, and a ninja, but he's able to do that because his great-grandfather may have had an eighth grade education. His grandfather completed high school and later took some courses at the city colleges of Chicago. But his parents, both of us have received higher education through a baccalaureate degree, uh, master's degrees, and then me with a doctorate. This for us, I know is powerful. I want to be able to make sure that people understand that what we do at Nevada State College is about building generational wealth, dis disrupting generational poverty and talking about social mobility. So I also want to build these connections by talking about those stories and also taking tours and visits because I want to make sure I understand the students and communities and families that we are choosing and willingly serve by understanding that and to recognize that Nevada State College, right? We're serving the state of Nevada. So how do we make sure that we take our mission and our brand, not just in Southern Nevada, but to the rest of Nevada as well? And this will culminate with my ability to hopefully in January have an inauguration and an investiture where I'm able to share with the college community internal and externally about what I've learned. The major themes and surprises, the concerns, the affirmations, the connections I've made internally and externally and identify a set of presidential and college areas of focus that are going to be important. I want to create a series of advisory councils who will work with me to help shape and advance the mission and brand of Nevada State College. I want to talk about any new donors that we may have uh, been able to ascertain, any organizational structure changes. And then also, uh, one of the things I've already learned about is this development, this land that's around us, what's going to be our strategy uh, for a framework to develop this. This is the work that I want to be able to talk about. I moved from this point of saying that I was um, the making of a scorpion, but that I was a scorpion made. And I want this inauguration week and the investiture to be a distinctly Nevada State experience. Many of you who have worked within other institutions of higher education understand the potency of what an inauguration week is. And I understand that, that may be somewhat new to some of uh, to some folks and maybe even new to uh, some so folks within the state. But we're doing this because Nevada State College is a distinctive type of organization. Um, and we're gonna work de deliberately to make sure that people understand who we are and what the work is that we're going to be doing at this organization. So let me end. Um, this way, and then I'll gladly take questions from you. Uh, many of you heard me talk about this idea of work. Um, I have talked here far longer 
and I probably would love to talk in any other space, but it was important, I think, to demonstrate to you to talk about who I am, how I choose to show up and do the work, how it influences the way I see leadership and how I'm going to come to be NSC born. I was struck when I first got here, I kept seeing that battle born and I went through and, and, and actually one day I said, I pulled over on the side of the road because I saw a big billboard. I pulled over to look up Battleborn and to understand how this state came to be uh, during a war and all the different things that go into that, the distinctiveness, the ruggedness, the, 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 the mentality that is imbued within the state. And I will tell you uh, that resonated because I kept thinking, I said, huh, Nevada State College is Nevada born. Uh, we were created for a purpose. And dare I say, Darian Pollard is going to be NSC born. Nevada State College is necessary for this moment. I have no doubt in my mind, our students deserve an institution that is bold and audacious about the work that we do and is unapologetic about the students we serve and the mission that we have the gloriousness of being able to do. Um, from this day forward, and I make this commitment to you, we are ignoring all of those folks who don't get what we do, who don't get our students, who don't understand how and why we exist. Because here's what I know. Uh, we were created for a purpose. Um, Nevada State College was created because others couldn't do this work, wouldn't do this work, didn't know this work needed to be done. We are here for a reason. And I am just simply elated to become the latest part of the story, the latest scorpion. So what I tell people, I told people watch me work. I have changed the pronoun, y'all, uh, because what I'm saying now is watch us work. Uh, Nevada State College, I am grateful uh, to be here and to be a part of this community. I'm grateful for the warmth and the generosity you extended to me. And I look forward uh, to dancing with you, to learning with you, to working hard with you, uh, to doing the work that our community and our students need. But most of all, I look forward to being able to say, I am NSC born. Thank you all. And I'm happy to respond to questions at this point. I believe uh, you can do that now. And I'll um, uh, ask uh, Dr. Amber and Dr. Shields and whoever, Dr. Sharp, if they would be so happy to help in this space. Absolutely. Questions? President Pollard, the excitement is palatable. I heard some clapping and some cheering here up on the third floor. So that is magnificent. We can't welcome you enough. We've been counting the days and here we are. So folks that are wanting to submit questions in this type of forum, you'll see towards the bottom, there's a Q&A um, segment. You got to click there and submit and they'll come straight here to me. Um, we do have um, a couple, and the first is a recommendation from Angel Ball that says, for focus groups, I'd love to suggest including the graduate speech language pathology externship partners. We have about 50 community partners serving our graduate students. Ah, that's a great, great recommendation. Thank you, Angel. Uh, I know that both Amber and I will note that and I'll bring it to the transition advisor committee and we'll, cause I think that's a great idea because again, our students, um, uh, we don't exist in a vacuum. The college doesn't, our students don't. So this idea of making sure that we are deeply connected to those partners is a great idea. Thank you, Angel. And um, the next question is before President Patterson left, he was in the process of changing us to Nevada State University. Hmm. Will you continue this process? Yeah, I, several people have asked me about this and I, part of what I have said and I've been very clear about this, I believe um, I wanna make a distinction about this. Is this a mission issue or is it a brand issue? And I need to understand that. So one of the questions I'm gonna be asking uh, the college community is to help me understand that. Um, I uh, had a brief conversation uh, with Bart before he left about this. I'm going back and reviewing some things to understand that. So what I, uh, this is what you're going to hear from Darian. I, I can't commit to saying that I'm going to advance that yet until I understand the why. Um, and you'll hear me oftentimes say this, and here's a great way of doing this. You'll hear me oftentimes say, why and why now? And if I understand the why and understand the why now, then I'm able to help carry that forward. But my, my initial conversation is going to be, is it a mission issue? Is it a branding 
uh, issue? And then why is that necessary at this particular point? I've heard some of the thoughts, both pro and against, to be quite frank. So I need to learn more about that. Uh, but I thank you. Uh, I think it was Susan who asked that question because I think it's an important one uh, to hear. Thank you. Wonderful. And we have a comment here that says, I truly appreciate your willingness to get input and set up focus groups, but will you have an anonymous way to give input? Hmm. So I have to tell you, uh, when I anonymous always strikes me as odd, and I'll tell you why. And this is, again, we all have our baggage <laughs> that we bring with us in different places. I've worked in an organization before where we had um, uh, uh, anonymous methods of communication uh, allowed, and, 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 and it was public. And as a result of that, it had, um, I think, the opportunity to not let us show our best self. So I always struggle with anonymous because I believe that we're members of an intellectual community that if we have the ability to agree with each other, we should have also the ability to disagree with each other. Um, and I also know though that ability around the issues of trust that go with that. So I need to process that anonymous part of that. I may say that it could come directly to me um, I generally don't do anonymous because of the concerns I have in that space, because I think sometimes anonymous people can take pot shots at people. They put information out there without having to own it later. Just like me sitting here in front of you all, my responses to questions I have to own, I think as well, people should have to own their questions and feedback. But what I will make the commitment to do is to be able to say you can send it directly to me so that I can have that versus having to go into a focus group or you'll also have the survey where you'll be able to participate and that will be something that will come directly to me. Uh, and we'll take the results, not the people, but the results uh, through the transition advisor community to give feedback as well. Great question, I thank you and, I, and I'll continue to give more thought to that as well. Um, I don't know if that's, again, a part of the culture here that I need to learn more that this is something that we do, uh, but I am, um, I'm going to process that, and I hope you can receive that, the, my response the way I intended. Thank you. And the next question is, I love the Mamba mentality. What do you do for <clears throat> self-care wise to keep you going? You are so powerful and very energetic leader. Oh, uh, thank you for that. So let me tell you a little story about this. Uh, a couple of people in the office heard me say this this morning when I came in. I am, uh, I appreciate that self-care is something I work really, really hard at. A few years ago, I had a, a health uh, situation. I, mean, I share with you, I, I went, wasn't feeling well. I think Miles had strep, Robin had strep. I went to the doctor to make sure I didn't have strep. I didn't have strep, but my blood pressure was out of the roof. And my doctor says, you are too smart for this, long story short, after a couple of visits. And she said, we're going to figure this out. She said, you have hereditary working against you. You have a job where you're getting paid to sit and think, and you're sitting too much and not sweating. And then she also had, she had the five S's. I'll tell you all the five S's sometimes because they were really good. But in addition to that, uh, she also uh, compelled me to lose weight. So I went on a journey. I've been on one um, and I have lost a, a tremendous amount of weight. I became a runner, but then it's picking up run running at 50, y'all. That was not smart. Uh, so I got some hip issues. So now I go to the altar of my elliptical and I run when I can. Uh, so I'm a big person on elliptical. I, I try to bring my lunch I make good choices about that. I practice wellness and meditation. In fact, this morning, um, I, you know, my meditation this morning was on uh, gratitude, which I thought the universe was speaking to me. Um, I try to stay active. I hate to sit still. I'm almost in trouble right now because I haven't stood up and my watch just told me you need to stand. So I try to do those things. The other part about self-care is also building networks of friends. Um, so I have them and I, uh, I have to rebuild those networks here, but that's important to me because my girlfriends and my boyfriends, they keep me honest, they, we laugh together and uh, several have already planned about our excursions to Vegas, so I really, really do that. Um, at the end of the day too, I don't take myself too seriously. Um, I, I really believe that um, I'm low maintenance, some people may disagree, but I try to be low maintenance. I try to laugh more. Joy is important to me, grace and kindness. So I think it is both the physical and the mental about how I try to do this work. And, um, and I lay off the caffeine every once in a while. Thank you for that observation. Fantastic. And a question about will information or updates be shared or communicated following the focus groups? 
Yes, yeah, so we're gonna do, my intent about the focus groups is that I'm going to do two things. One, take summaries of those and bring them to my transition advisor committee, talk about them. You'll also hear me talk, uh, my weekly message. I may say, I heard this great quote, give me some feedback on this. And then I'm gonna produce a summative report that I'll be sharing with the college community in January. So one of the things I'm gonna ask for your grace in this and that um, uh, is gonna be a mutual path because I wanna honor the, the, the iterative process about how these come about, while at the same time being very deliberate about saying, okay, here's a big thing I've already heard. So let me, let me try to address that or speak to it or put in some process, because going back to that press model, if I'm going to acknowledge it and own it and then put in solutions, part of what I have to do is to tell you what's the source of that. And I also want to make sure that I'm not just responding to you know, such and such anonymously wrote in, here's this issue. And then I look up and realize, oh, that was, that was Darian's issue. That wasn't everybody's wow. issue. They try to speak on behalf of a particular group. So the long answer to that is yes, we're going to try different methodologies on that and try to be very deliberate about how we interpret that, which is why I have that advisory committee to help me make sense of what I'm hearing. Because there's a whole lot of, you know, I, I taught English for many years and all the literature teachers will appreciate this. For every text that you have, there's a there's a context, there's a subtext, there's a pretext, there's the post text, you know, whether you're doing a reader response or you're doing a formalist interpretation, all of the text exists. So I want to make sure that I'm giving the text the appropriate amount of, of, of analysis in order to make meaning of it and using multiple lenses to do that. Great question. Thank you. Okay, and unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all of the questions, but we are able to capture them. But I do want to end with this fun question from Dr. Laura Nauman. She asked, what types of games do you and your family like to play? Oh, my gosh. So my little boy, well, okay, I'm a big cars. I grew up in Chicago, so I grew up playing spades. I'm a big spades player, and I talk a lot of you know what, when I'm with plants, so that's always very fun. Um, I also think a lot about the fact that we, we just picked up a cart. So we do Uno. Uh, we have, what's the one? Uh, my God, I'm blanking. It's something with numbers in it. We do that a lot. Uh, we have Pictionary, which none of us are good drawers, which is hilarious. My son, his handwriting looks like chicken scratch and I thought mine was bad. So those are some of the ones we do. Um, oh, that one flip up over the head because those are things we do. So we have a really good time as a family. Uh, bowling, we love bowling too. None of us are very good at it. Uh, Miles actually is actually pretty good, but we don't tell him that we don't want his head to get too big. Um, and I know we're coming to an end. So thank you for that question. Let me just do, I saw a couple in here that popped up that I can talk on as we we're going out. Um, I believe that we need to talk a lot about, I appreciate the fact that someone has brought up about ableism in higher education. This is a very important issue that we were starting to grapple with in Montgomery College before I left, because it wasn't something we talked about, both in terms of students, but also in terms of employees. We make assumptions, so we need to be very thoughtful about that. I appreciate your observation about that, that question. Um, I prefer to be referred to if you mean my pronouns, she, her, hers, but Darian, my first name, I'm quite comfortable with that. I also uh, want to be very deliberate about the fact that uh, many of you have given me some great welcomes. I, lo I love that. Thank you with that. Maybe we need to have a game night. I think that'd be kind of fun. Trivia, I like that's fun sometimes too. And the last one, somebody talked about social justice. I want to end on this note on the virus. Um, I, I do not think it is lost. It should not be lost to any of us. As a country, we have been fighting, and at the same time, at least I say two, possibly three pandemics. Uh, we have been fighting the pandemic of COVID-19 and the disproportionate effect that has had on black and brown communities and people of color, people who had in, uh, compromised immune systems and all the types of things that go with that. Conversely, we're talking about a pandemic around race in this country that we're just still trying to figure out how to name and own and grapple with. And you know, one of the things I worry about is when the vaccine came out, I thought people were going to stop talking about disparities in the healthcare system. You know, after George Floyd was murdered, everybody was like, let's figure out how to be all about do all the DEI work. And all of a sudden it started to die. We need to make sure that doesn't happen. We also have the pandemic of opioids and uh, that's happening in our in our communities. So for me, that you are right on about naming this social justice issue. And the fact 
that we have as higher education institutions, the ability to be the public square, to get the right information out, to advance vaccines in a way that can help people make choices for them and their families, to talk about the impact of this in our community is so important. So I am a tremendously grateful uh, for you to raise that and we we'll hope that we should be convening and bringing our experts. We have faculty on our uh, who work at this institution who are experts in this work. Let's have them out talking about it and doing public conversations and being a part of advancing that. Please protect yourselves, protect your families. We have to treat our students both as consumers and learners in this, in this pandemic, pandemics and being prepared as an organization to serve them the best we can is important. Thank you, I probably went over a little bit, but I wanted to make sure we got this. Thank you all and thank you for the virtual hugs, I need it.